1987, our first guest tonight became a living legend in Irish sport, and he was assured of cycling immortality when he became only the second man in history to win the Giro d'Italia, the Tour de France, and the World Championship in the same year. In a professional career that spanned over 12 years, he enjoyed over 71 victories, including some of the biggest in cycling. Let's just remind ourselves how great he was. He's racing and pacing and plotting the course. He's fighting and bonding and riding on his horse. He's racing and pacing and plotting the course. He's fighting and bonding and riding on his horse. He's going the distance. He's going for speed. He's going the distance. Well, the whole nation was behind him as he battled against the odds to win the Tour de France, and now he must do battle again. Will you welcome, please, Mr. Stephen Roach. <laughs> Stephen, you're very welcome. Thank you. Um, as you probably read in the newspapers, uh, the name Stephen Roach has turned up in the files of an Italian doctor. Now, this doctor is under investigation for doping athletes. He hasn't been convicted yet, but the investigation is underway. His name is Dr. Conconi, and he was involved in experiments uh, with EPO. It's an almost undetectable substance which boosts an athlete's performance. Now, Dr. Conconi's experiments were supposedly carried out on 23 amateur athletes, and now it's claimed that these amateur athletes didn't exist at all, he had 23 top professionals involved in these tests, and Stephen Roach was one of them. Uh, Stephen, this allegation, which has uh, been repeated in quite a number of the newspapers, what is your response to it? Well, I think, um, first of all, I think one of the reasons that I actually took the trouble of coming over uh, to, to your, your program, Pat, it's always nice to be in your program, but it's, uh, I've often been on on better uh, more joyful occasions, but um, my main aim, I think, is really about credibility, because uh, everything I've ever done right through when I was an apprentice fitter, everything I did when I was, even before that, and all through my career, it was all about credibility and going on and going further and working for everything that I achieved and always putting the bar further and further away to try and achieve it. And um, when you have accusations like we've had in the papers over the last few, few months, last few weeks, actually, and like I heard you saying earlier on, Pat, uh, liars, whereas I don't really take them as being liars, I take it basically as being probably sensationalism more than liars. Yeah, but you're saying they're not true. I'm not saying they're not true, no. What I'm saying is my participation and my involvement is totally untrue. Okay, I'm but totally you're saying that it. you did not take mm -hmm. EPO. I mean, and we'll talk about that in a few moments. But when you look at that uh, video of you winning the Tour de France, and I suppose some of the shots reminded you of the pain that you went through. Do you feel that in the public mind that victory is now tarnished because of these stories? Well, whether it's in the public eye or whatever, in my own eye it's, uh, it's tarnished because um, Joe Public on the street will always believe certain things and they, they believe, some believe this, some believe that. Um, newspapers, papers don't refuse ink and I think basically what I'm about is that to try and put the record straight and people can decide them within themselves whether they believe sensationalism that have become part of our modern day life, whether it be agitated self in politics, whether it be in the church, whether it be in sport, and to put the record straight concerning Stephen Roach. What was the reaction of, well, your reaction initially when you heard of this? I mean, did you know this was coming? No. It was a, a New Year's bonanza, a new millennium bonanza. I got a, uh, I got a call on, it was New Year's Eve, I think it was, <clears throat> from uh, the Sony Independent saying, we've had this information, what, what's your response to it? I said, well, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not involved in anything at all. I said, I'll stand over everything I've ever done, and uh, I was never involved in anything at all whatsoever, and I'll, I'll, I sleep at night time, uh, no problems, knowing that nothing will ever come out of the woodwork. The journalist got a full page out of that, <laughs> yeah. and other stuff. And um, I thought, that's it, like, it'll go away now. It's basically, what more can somebody pull out of the bag? Then other journalists picked up on it. Then another journalist picked up then the Sunday Times, and he really went to town on it, and rang me the day before he went to print and said, we have this information, we have proof, we have documents. So I said, well, you know, if you're going to print them, you know, be very, very sure you're, you're backed up, because there's no documents 
in this world that will ever prove me to be close or involved in any organisation or in any drug-related, uh, taking performance enhancing drugs. Is your denial more difficult because of what happened in the year that the Tour de France came to Ireland, when there was a bust, and then it was revealed that so many of the cyclists were taking whatever it was at the time. Uh, there was a man on his way to Ireland who was arrested by the police. And the impression then came that that, that particular Tour de France was a farce, and the impression was given that the, the sport was riddled with drugs, which, in many people's view, it is. Well, um, so people are saying, you know, they must have been there in Stephen's say, time. Well, people, the, the, unfortunately, the, the illness of the 90s uh, is that uh, when an athlete does something, no matter what sport he's in, the first question is, what's he on? Or what's she on? And that, unfortunately, has, been, has come out so many times in the past, and especially in the past 10 years or so. And I put it down to that journalists have gotten into the, the habit of writing sensational articles. True or false, they have written good stuff, they've written some sensational stuff. And the kids in the street, the cyclists today, or the athletes today, are 25 years of age. 10 years ago, they were only 15. And they were reading in the paper that you've got to take drugs to win a race, you've got to take drugs to beat so-and-so, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. They're telling you what drugs to take, they're telling you where you buy them, how to mask them. Yeah. That guy that was 15, 10 years ago is now 25 and has in his mind, I read in the papers, that you have to take a certain drug, or you have to do this, you have to do that, if you want to win. If you go back, though, to Paul Kimmage's book, and Paul said that he was offered that choice to take drugs and perhaps succeed more than he did. He was a very good amateur rider. What was he, sixth in the world mm. as a junior amateur rider? And then didn't make it in the professional game, wrote his book and said, look, this is the choice that you have to make if you want to succeed in the professional game. And that's a long time ago. And you weren't very kind to his book. No, but I think, Pat, you must remember, I was still very active. I was world champion at the time as well. And I wasn't very fond of... I was a little bit naive into a lot of things. And uh, someone like Paul, who was very, very fond of that I grew up with, and uh, shared a room with him for two years, or for one year, when he joined my team in Fegger, I gave him a job. And um, I uh, brought him into Tour de France the year he wrote his article for the Tribune, which helped get him in turn his full-time job. And I felt kind of, I feel even to this day, partly responsible for his success. And I found it very difficult to swallow the fact that here's a guy that was, has everything out of cycling. His parents were in cycling to get him a bike when he was a kid. He believed in going ahead and riding the Tour de France one day. He rode a Tour de France, a childhood dream. And here he is now just on a little bit of kind of generalizing on what he had seen in the peloton as to be this is the way it happens. Yeah, but I mean, you must have been aware, as he was made aware by being offered that choice, that people were on drugs. I'm not well, saying EPO, but I mean, they were on stuff to get them working the well, following morning. I had a choice morning. as well. I had a choice as well, and I didn't take it. So you were offered drugs? No, offered drugs. I could offer drugs, but you have, when you sit in a race, for example, and you see a guy winning you, and you always get a, an echo somewhere around, well, he might be taking something, he might be doing this, but he's going to a medical test, he's giving his urine, is being sampled, it's being tested for the drugs that are supposed to be available and it's coming back negative. So people are saying, okay, well, he wasn't taking stuff, there's no proof. So you get on with it. But looking at the other way, for example, if I'm an athlete, for example, and I say, this guy's taking stuff, I better take stuff as well to beat him. Well, what, what's he going to take the next time to beat me? What's, what are you going to take to beat him the next time? So where's the finish? I think you have to be clear in your own mind what you want out of sport. You yeah. want to win, you want to be able to sleep at night time. For me, life started for me when my career finished. Okay, just to put this in perspective, when you went professional, um, maybe before you were exposed to the, the, the full rigour of what might be on uh, offer on the circuit, I mean, you were a very early winner, isn't that so? Um, well, I won, every, I won I mean, at all stages during my life. When, when you went professional, did you win anything in year one? I won. I'm the still the youngest rider to have won Paris-Nice after three months of professional, as a professional athlete. I won, people would relate to it here, the Ross Talton or the Health Race. I won it. I'm still the youngest rider ever to have won that. I was junior champion. I was, I don't think I was schoolboy champion, but I was second in the senior championships. I was the best amateur in France in 1980. Um, my career just didn't just blossom around EPO or around a, uh, any drugs or and anything else. And you won else. 71 events yeah. in your career. But in those 71 events, like, one of them lasted three weeks, one of them lasted three and a half weeks the Tour of Italy and the Tour de France. Yeah. They weren't big paydays either, were they? I mean, nowadays, a Tour winner, a Tour de France winner, will take almost, what, a quarter of a million pounds? The Tour winner will, be, will get in prize about 220,000 pounds, but that, of course, is given back to his teammates and personnel and everything else. Yeah. When I won it, I got 28,000 pounds. 28,000. <laughs> Plus a Peugeot one, uh, 205 car. <laughs> right, so it has changed dramatically, has and changed. the rewards are very high now, although for 
if you compare it to tennis or any of the other top sports, or even Roy Keane plays a match and he gets 50 grand, um, the rewards are not that great for the effort that's they're, put they're, in. They're not, but I know where you're getting at, Pat. You're probably saying, well, the money is there, so the, the, the will to win is there, so you must take doping and everything else. But I have difficulty in agreeing with that, because I always felt that, like, at, you, if I wanted to earn money, it would have been a Formula One driver, but I wasn't of the cyclist. In cycling, the payday was X number of pounds. That's what I was going for. I wasn't going for the money that was the coach I should be there or the money the sport earned. So I wasn't fighting, in fact. I, my attitude was, the more races you win, the more money you earn. And the more races you win, the more money you earn, the better you better become known as well. There was never a fact that, well, I got to earn the money before winning, before, yeah. before, uh, winning the okay, race. Okay, so, so let's just get your definitive uh, statement on EPO or any of the other performance drugs, but this is the one that is in the news at the moment. Did you ever take EPO? Never. Did do you think it's possible that you were given never. EPO without never. Never, your never, knowledge? Never, 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 never. Just end of story. Never ever story. It's not even something that, you know, I can even I don't got to think about it, Pat. There's no way I'd be saying here in a month's time or a year's time or ten years time that, oh, I forgot. Maybe once somebody gave me something that I didn't know about. I was just saying, no, end of category. There's no, no question that your doctor, the team doctor, Dr. Grazzi, who Everything would be acquainted with Dr. Conconi, isn't that so? He would be. Everything I ever took, everything, I used to amuse myself in writing down everything I took in vitamins, minerals, and everything else. And I even wrote down the next on top of the page when I had sex with my wife. <laughs> That'll tell you how dedicated I was. Everything was down in this book because that, of course, can also uh, change your, uh, your, your performance as well. And it, uh, on the bike, I mean. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it, uh, it, um, it was important. So I used to do right. that for So, for so you would knowledge. be seen, for example, it's possible that someone would see you taking stuff, which could be vitamins or supplements, exactly. or you could get a shot of something that would be quite legal and... It became very, very popular in the mid-80s to actually to inject yourself with vitamins because orally, it put a lot, they reckon they put a lot of pressure on your stomach, so it's better taking it by injection form, which is, very, which is very current, and to this day, it's probably the most successful way of administrating uh, vitamins. Okay. The impact of all of this on you and Lydia and your extended family, your mother and father, what has it been? It's been very traumatic, I must say, because um, me myself being away living over in France has been maybe a little bit distant. But uh, I must say, the first phone call from the Sunday Independent wasn't that gra great because I thought, well, it doesn't matter, nothing's going to come out of this. Then you get a paper the following week and then the following day and the next day again you get people sending me over faxes with different headlines and everything else. The headlines, of course, are very sensational. But when you read down the articles, there was very little in there to prove that they ever did anything. So I was wondering, where are they getting all this from? Then the Sunday Times then produced their article. But my daughter, Christelle, was getting some of the facts as well. And she got a bit upset because, you must remember, she's How 12, old is she now? 13 years of age. So when I was top of my career, she was three and four years of age. She would have come along to one or two criteriums, but wouldn't have really known what her daddy was all about. I remember one time my son coming along to race and he was shouting, come on Miguel, come on Miguel, Miguel Indiran. Yeah. And after the race says to him, why were you shouting for Miguel and not me? And he says to me, because daddy, Miguel won the Tour de France. Uh -huh. Whereas he was too young to have understood that I actually won the Tour de France and more. Whereas now they're at an age to understand when everywhere we go and recognised and have different, um, do different things. So at the age that I realised what I did do, and all of a sudden you have these papers coming up now and saying roach drug, roach okay. involved in drug but scandals. It's been your, very traumatic. Your contention about yourself is that uh, you had an extraordinary physical prowess and a determination and that you could do it while being clean. Definitely. And I think any athlete can do it today and I will stand over that. And if some athlete had the same power that I had, I'd be very, very, I'd be able to stand there opposite him and tell him that he can do it as well. Okay. The problem today is that everyone is telling everybody else you need to take drugs to succeed in sport. Okay, Stephen is staying with us uh, and one of the sceptics, uh, someone you've mentioned in passing, will be joining us after this commercial break. And now, new from Nivea Visage, the first night cream to contain anti-wrinkle Q10 and vitamin A. Clinical tests prove it reduces the appearance of wrinkles, helping your skin's renewal process night by night. Guaranteed. New anti-wrinkle Q10 repair night cream from Nivea Visage. Stock up on your Kleenex, folks, as Shelley shocks Dolores. This week, read about the impending storm. Also, Marion Finucan talks about building on the past in this week's RTE Guide. 
Discover savings of up to 50% in all departments at Cleary's wonderful winter sale ends Saturday. Aer Lingus has more direct flights to more US cities than any other airline flying out of Ireland this summer. In our different ways, we all have a talent for communication.